Hey, 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 happy Monday. Come on in, pull up a chair. The Daily Dope is in the air. And tonight, I am going to be sharing a how to play as well as reviewing Egizia Shifting Sands from my friends over at Stronghold Games. So, is this a must have Egyptian themed classic? Kind of revamped for the 21st century, although I think it came out in the 21st century originally. Or uh, is this just old and dusty and musty and might as well just move on past? Well, you'll find out in just a few right after this. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Yes, I'm Jeff McAleer, back once again as your host here at The Daily Dope, presented by TheGamingGang.com, which I happen to be the Grand Poobah. That's right, I am the founder and editor-in-chief. So tonight is Monday, March 3rd. This is the first show of March 2020. This is episode 450. Zoinks! Boom. It's like, whoa. Yes, 450 episodes of the Daily Dope. And I will have an announcement about the future of the live show in a few moments. So do want to point out, if this is your first time visiting, this is a very, very casual show. It's basically just tabletop gaming. Uh, a lot of times I'm doing news, sometimes reviews, sometimes unboxings. Of course, as I mentioned, in tonight's open, I will be showing you how to play as well as reviewing Egizia Shifting Sands from my pals at Stronghold Games. But we'll get into that in just a few minutes. We're going to take care of a few things real quickly as well. So I do want to point out, because this is a live stream, that also means there is chat available on YouTube. It's not on screen. It's one of the ways that I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. But I do pay attention to chat as best I can, especially when I'm doing a how to play a review. Sometimes chat kind of flies past rather quickly. But if you want to say howdy, or maybe you've got a question or a comment, by all means, fire away. I will do my best to respond. So tonight we've already got the madman in chat. We've got a gray day, Rob German. Uh, I believe that's who we've got in chat so far who is chiming in. So. Good to see everybody. If you want to mention, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you watch the show, if you watch live, you really should be thumbing up the video. I mean, if you watch all the time and don't hit the little, like, thumb up, I don't know why you're watching. <laughs> it's like, okay, I don't like this guy, but I watch all the time. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're a masochist. I have no clue. But do also want to point out, subscribe to the channel if you do. Don't forget, ring that little bell because it will not only notify you when the Gaming Gang's uh, videos get uploaded, you know, standalone videos. It'll also tell you when the live stream goes live. Also, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel for the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. All right, so welcome aboard, everybody. It's Monday. It's Monday. I was at C2E2 over the weekend. That is a um, comic and pop culture uh, convention that's uh, held at McCormick Place, downtown Chicago, that we, uh, we get press passes every year. And uh, went down there. I only go for one day. I only go down there on Friday because, I mean, the, the show is fine. I just, it, it seems to be that whenever I go down there, there's, you know, whatever day I'm there, the panels aren't very exciting. Nothing's really going on. Uh, there aren't as many uh, comic publishers who are there as who once were at the Chicago conventions, which is not unusual. I mean, it's not just C2E2 that they're not going to. 
That's every other show outside of maybe New York Comic Con and San Diego Comic Con. But uh, we did see Marvel. We did see DC. We saw some real small independents that even I'm not familiar with. But there was more of a uh, gaming influence to the convention as well. There was a section. I didn't have an opportunity to see it. I'll explain why in a moment. But there was actually a section. It was uh, for Dungeons and Dragons. It was the to teach you how to play D and D, I thought that was kind of cool. I saw that in the program. Although, like I said, I think it was past Artist Alley is my guess is where it may have been, and I really didn't get an opportunity to get into Artist Alley. But uh, also, I had a chance to say howdy and talk to some folks from Deep Water Games. So we may be seeing some interviews from them in the future. So uh, Deepwater has, um, oh, they've got that roll and write game where you're playing an architect. So that's one of them. Now there's another big one that's coming out. Uh, I can't remember. See, you know, get old and your mind just goes, huh? But uh, I was I was very surprised. I was like, wow. So I chatted with them. Uh, I talked to Rick Mainz from Chaosium Inc. because they had a booth there, chatted for a few moments. There were a few uh, small gaming companies as well that I was not familiar with that I did talk with and also tossed out some cards too. So that was cool. So the reason why I didn't get to see everything is because I'm with, I was with my brother and then my brother had a couple, uh, well, his friend from New York, David, who usually hangs out with us also at San Diego Comic Con, he flew in uh, with one of his friends, and they're all comic guys, and they're all looking at, you know, filling their, you know, their numbers that they're missing of different series and stuff like that. And I forgot my phone at home. <laughs> I was like, well, I can't just stroll off because I will never. I wasn't driving. My brother drove, uh, so it was kind of like, huh. Well, if I don't hang with these guys, I am never gonna find them again so and every time we'd spend of course there's all these comic book dealers there. anybody had a long box of comics they were paid they were flipping through them and i was like oh so of course we got to talk to our friends over at graham crackers comics so that was cool so that was uh that's always fun talk to mike and angry john and of course jamie graham the owner so so that was pretty cool so one of the one of the funniest things that I ran across is, and of course, you know, I'm looking around and yeah, I'm always taking a peek to see what's going on, checking out some of the, the various different uh, exhibitors and dealers and things like that. So I saw something that I was not familiar with. Timid monsters. And they are handmade little monsters. Uh, I believe that they are based out of Colorado Springs, Colorado. Which is funny, I used to go through Colorado Springs all the time when I was delivering RVs. In fact, I delivered RVs to Colorado Springs, let's say three times. So uh, so I, I saw these and I stopped and I was like, okay. Well, actually I saw them as I walked past and then later on, about a half hour before the convention hall was closing, I was like, you know, I'm gonna swing over, take a look at these. So I wanted to share Timid Monsters because not all art should be serious. And uh, the company uh, and artist, uh, the artist is, I should say, Trish Czech. I believe that's probably how it's pronounced because it's like Czech as in Czech Republic. And uh, it is her company. She has a website, of course. I'm sharing it right now. TimidMonsters.com. Had an opportunity to talk with her a little bit. And it was funny, I saw that they had the Gen Con buttons. And I had said, hey, um, do, do you exhibit at Gen Con? And she's like, oh yeah, we've gone for a few years. And I guess the first year was when uh, a, if you go to Gen Con, you'll know this, you'll remember this. It was just a few years ago that they, they opened up another section of the exhibit hall. And then the first year, especially, they just took every small company and threw them over there. And we kept joking that it was like the dirt ball. And 
even the lighting was a lot lower. It was weird. It was very, very bizarre. Now, these days, they've mixed things up so we've got bigger publishers all throughout, as opposed to just throw all these new people and small publishers in a corner. So, but uh, yes, and uh, a great day is pointing out that, yes, they have an Etsy shop, too. They do. In fact, they've got loads of ways for you to check out Timid Monsters. Uh, so I purchased a couple. So I thought I'd share them with you. I know, I'm such a goofball, aren't I? I thought these were cute. So, and I think these are things, especially if you're into role-playing games, you're going to love these. You're going to love these little monsters. I mean, just, just imagine with, you know, a couple of 20-sided dice. Um, maybe they're the guardians of your dice. So we've got Splotch. Let me hold Splotch over here for you. As you can see, these are not large. Uh, I believe these are made out of some sort of a clay because these are handmade. They're, they're not made with molds. And I believe they're made in about 10. Uh, I believe I want to say about 10 to a, like a series, right? So this is Splotch, and it says, Splotch the Timid Monster is a fan of neutral tones and bland decor. So each of your little monsters gets their own little card. And of course, it says timidmonsters.com on the other side. So that's Splotch. And then I've got Orbit. Orbit the Timid Monster only eats things she finds on her major kitchen appliances. And it would appreciate it if you would sweep up the dust bunnies once in a while. She's tired of the competition. Ah. So these were each 10 bucks. And I was like, you know what? I just got to get it. I have just, I would have gotten more, but I, I would have felt like such a total goofball. You know, I'm 52 years old buying these things. But, uh. Like, even, like, the little eye, you know, so you see the little pupil of the eye. That's not a little, uh, like, ink dot. That's actually a little dot right there in the middle. These are not toys, do you want to point out? These are pieces of art. But, uh, yes, a gray day says, at Timid Monsters. Yes, that is correct, at Timid Monsters. Uh, for your Twitter, they are on Facebook, Instagram. There's a, a Gmail email as well. So, uh, by all means, most definitely check this out. Check out the Timid Monsters. There's a slew of different ones. There's a Patreon, I believe, that Trish has as well, that you can sign up and kind of get exclusive or limited edition Timid Monsters. Uh, I think some are sold out. I think some memberships are sold out that uh, you can no longer actually sign up. But I think there's a few... At uh, things like the twenty dollar level, something like that. There are different ones. They are different sizes and things like that. But I just got the little, little ones here, and it's funny. They came in. Each of them came in their own little box, their own little timid monsters stamped box, and they went into a bag that was stamped timid monsters. So. They are going to go up behind me. So the madman says, my 17-year-old daughter would love these. I did say they were for my daughter, right? Yes. Yes, madman. You said they're for your daughter. Like I said, I mean, you know, you could, you, you're having game night, and you know, you got a, got a D20 that's not behaving. Put it over by Splotch here. Have Splotch keep an eye on it. Maybe change up that luck, right? So I thought these were just, I thought these were hysterical. I really did. So by all means, check it out. I will uh, throw up a little news piece in, uh, in the cool stuff section of the website as well. All right. So anyway, wanted to share that. I, I got to be honest. I mean, that was, that was kind of one of the highlights of C2E2 for me. I know. Like I said, it was just, oh, it's, just, and it's okay. I mean, I understand, like, my brother and his friends, they're there for comics, you know? It's like, even though my brother's supposed to be my videographer. So Rob German says they would make a great anchor for a game. They would, wouldn't they? Maybe a little card game or something like that? A 
I think they'd make a pretty good theme. Obviously enough, you can see by, if you go to the Timid Monsters website, timidmonsters.com, you'll see obviously somebody there has some artistic talent. And you'd easily see that various different monsters going on, on cards, right? You know, I don't know. I don't know. All right, other thing I wanted to mention is uh, I received a lot of these stalls. I think this is a prototype copy that uh, I received from my pals over at Flying Pig Games. This is currently on Kickstarter. I think it's got a couple of weeks left, maybe a little more than that. Wednesday, I'll look for a, uh, a video, a first look, and kind of dive into this. If I have an opportunity to play it before then, I will share some thoughts on it. I don't specifically do reviews of Kickstarters, but I mean, this is shrink wrapped and everything. So this is uh, no doubt, this is probably an advanced copy from Mark H. Walker. All right, other thing I do want to mention uh, as I uh, opened up the show. There you go, Gray Day says, yeah, good first player marker for the little, little timid monsters. So what I'm going to do is obviously because, you know, I put this all, I have all these, you know, all these gigas or whatever you want to call them. I don't call them knickknacks. I have like little figures and things like that. So. I'm going to put Splotch like up there. So, I'll put Orbit probably up here next to my stink box cat. I know, I know. What can I tell you? I don't take life that seriously. I think, I think people understand that, right? I mean, I take serious things seriously, but other things. So anyway, so uh, I had mentioned before that tonight I was going to announce what's going to happen with the Daily Dope because. Uh, I had started it where the show was news and unboxings and reviews or what have you, first looks, page throughs of RPG products. And those shows were really long, <laughs> sometimes an hour and a half or more. And you figure those were five days a week. And it was weird. I, I would I would get more people viewing just videos that are standalone videos where it's like, oh, hey, I'm reviewing whatever. I'm reviewing whatever. So then we were just doing news. Didn't get a ton of views. Then for the past uh, about a week and a half, I have not been doing news and I have simply been doing like, unboxings, first looks, uh, some reviews, had quite a few reviews actually. Uh, and same thing, it's still, you know, about a hundred viewers. So what I'm gonna do is I am taking the rest of this week off. So I am taking a little bit of a break. Not that, you know, not that I'm like, oh my God, I'm like burned out. Just uh, taking a little bit of a break, just kind of recharging my batteries a little bit. A uh, week from tonight, the Daily Dope will return. We're just going to do news. Just going to do news, and I will not do shows on Friday nights. So that was another thing that uh, was going on is that, uh, so Monday through Friday, I would do a show. And usually Friday nights, a lot of people, that's people's game nights, uh, including myself way back. Uh, so what I decided is that uh, I will do Monday through Thursday, just doing news, probably 30 minutes, 40 minutes a show. And I will still do the standalone videos as well. So Joe Besser fan is uh, catching, catching up with us. And also saying it's always good to catch your breath. Yeah, just uh, just need to you know, just you know. Eh, it is what it is. You know, I'm I'm in my tenth year of covering tabletop gaming. It it is what it is. It's not as if suddenly I'm going to become a super popular streamer, and all of a sudden I'm going to have thousands of people watching. It's not going to happen. I understand that I am, um, you know, acquired taste, most definitely. So, Rob German likes that. So, 
Anyways, so as I mentioned, I am going to share a how to play as well as review of Egizia Shifting Sands as it turned the box the right way. I was like, I'm going to be sharing this. There you go. I already did a, uh, an unboxing first look. So what we're going to do is we're going to jump in. We are going to talk a little bit about how to play, show off some of the components, uh, and share my thoughts. And I will provide a review score as well. So let's move on over to the other camera again. So well, as I was talking in that, I was moving all the timid monster stuff away. So I am going to uh, switch over here. So as I mentioned, Egizia Shifting Sands is from Stronghold Games. It's for two to four players, ages 14 and up. It's 14 and up, obviously, because of the small pieces in this, not because it's... Uh, you know, heavy mental lifting by any stretch of the imagination. Game plays in about 90 minutes, depending really on your player count. You can knock out a two-player game in about an hour, I must admit. This is available now. It came out in late January. I do believe that uh, they actually, I believe Stronghold Games and uh, Indie Boards and Cards, uh, who are now, like, together... I think they had a print run, and then they had a second print run. Because I know they sold out really quickly, but those may have been the Kickstarter editions. Because the edition that we've taken a look at, and I'm going to review here tonight, is actually the retail edition. As I mentioned, it does carry an MSRP of $49.95. So let's zoom back out. I can show this off for everybody here. Let's get my hand out of the way. All right. That be... Let's get more. There we go. Okay. So, and I will kind of zoom in to get a better look at some of these things. Also, the premise of Egizia Shifting Sands is each of the players represent kind of a, a builder of ancient Egypt. And yes, I know you can't swing a a dead cat without hitting some ancient Egypt board game. But Egizia has been out. The original Egizia was out for quite some time. Then it was out of print for a while. And I want to point out that this is effectively, well, the original Egizia was one of the first Euro games I ever played. In fact, I played this before we launched the GamingGang.com. How about that? Yes. So I had played this with uh, Elliot Miller. I was living out in Arizona in the Phoenix area. And I came back to Chicago to visit, you know, family and, and things like that. And uh, got together with Elliot and we played Egizia. Played uh, a few games while I was in town. And uh, when I got back to Phoenix, I picked up some games and that's when the discussion started that, uh, hey, you know, I don't, because I, at that time it was just like the Dice Tower and uh, Game On with Cody and John and the Steel. There weren't a whole lot of people there. Yeah, there was Fortress Ameritrash, but there weren't a lot of people covering tabletop gaming. And I said to Elliot, I said, hey, you know, we've been playing this stuff for years. You know, <laughs> I'm like, I bet you we could do this better than some of these other people. And essentially, we uh, everybody else had podcasts. And I said, why don't we do it? Let's do a website and a podcast. And uh, we did the podcast for a few years. About, I think, three. And then uh, Elliot wanted to branch out and do his own thing. I was like, okay, that's cool. So, uh, as Joe Besserfan says, that's a good-looking board. Yes, it is. It is a dual-sided board as well, I should point out. Because... It is uh, for the two-player board is on one side, and then this is the three- or four-player board on this side here. And I just want to make sure everything looks like it is nice and sharply focused. See, because that's something that I've noticed from time to time is um, my preview is pretty small, but I see you know, what's going on. Uh, and so I can't tell when things are a little out of focus. So everything looks okay. And uh, I will double check that from time to time. 
So anyway, the premise of the game is that uh, you are builders and you are looking to, to build the great monuments of Egypt. And whoever comes out on top with the most victory points is the winner. So let's uh, we're going to tour the board a little bit. I will point out I am not going to go through every single aspect of the game. Simply enough, uh, because I'm sure there's, I know there's loads and loads of how to play videos out there. No doubt. I'm sure Rodney Smith has one out there uh, that uh, that will go into every little nuts and bolts of this. But uh, let's tour the board a little bit. First off, we have running around the board is our victory point tracker. And we go from 1 to 49. If for some reason you were to pass 49 victory points, we do have a 50 side. So then you're going to be moving along say as the yellow player right you'd be moving along you're going to add 50 to whatever you're on right so 53 and if you have to happen to blow past 100 flip this on over for 100. so each of the players are going to have their own colored bricks they're going to have their own color ships they're going to have their own board as well their own player board that they're going to track their their crews as well as their stone this is a worker placement game but funny enough your workers which are represented by these tokens here they're really not what you're placing you're placing ships so uh that was one of the first things that i thought was kind of interesting is you're going to track your your work crews as well as your foreman here but uh, you're not actually placing them. You're not placing them at all. Okay, so we've got the Nile. This is the Nile. Yes, I, I could make one of those denial jokes, but I won't. So we have the Nile here, and we have all these little, little offshoots from the Nile where you're going to be able to place your ships. Either receive a card going down this way, or receive a benefit, like so, or to build. So this section here, you see where we've got these little three squares. Now, one thing you'll see is, which for an example here, one ship, if one ship goes there, that's it. That's all that's going to go there. Once that ship is placed, somebody places a ship here, nobody can use this location. Like standard worker placement game. These areas here that we have little dots, we can actually have multiple ships that are going to be uh, taking part. And these are building. These are building. So this is building the, ob the obelisk. This is building the colonnades. This is building um, the pyramid. And then we also have the Sphinx down here. And the Sphinx actually gets a deck of cards, which I moved. Because I didn't want to knock it all over the place as I like. So we've got that. Then, hey, uh, so we've got Jorge Rodriguez and Robert Schneggenberger, which I always think I'm mispronouncing that, which I probably am. So good to see you, Robert. Good to see you, Jorge. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, so on this side, we have these cards. We have these various different cards, and these will change from turn to turn. There are five turns in the game, and each turn is broken down into phases as well. So we've got these different, we've got some that are immediate cards, some are permanent cards, some give you uh, some fields to produce grain because you have to feed your crews. We have some that are quarries that produce stone because you use stone to actually build and we've got some things that just do uh, like special effects, special one-time uses, some are permanent, so on and so forth. So we have these different decks. So when we're playing the first two turns, we're gonna use this deck here. And we just randomly deal these out. So we shuffle this up and then we deal these out. Then third and fourth turn, we're gonna use this deck. Fifth turn, we're gonna use this deck. After the fifth turn, 
then we're basically going to look at victory points. We're going to uh, add up all our victory points and see who is the winner. We have these tokens here on the colonnades. We've got the yellow and the purple, and these are special bonuses for if you're building in these colonnades. Then we also have these cards here, which uh, are interesting because what you can do is you can assign your blocks to them, say for an example like this, bricks in the obelisk. So what you're looking to do is you're trying to be the person who scores extra victory points for having the bricks in the obelisk. So you can place these like so. Also, you're going to be placing them here as you're building the colonnades. You're going to build the colonnades from left to right. We also have victory point totals there. We've got the obelisk as you're building that. And it's going to tell you, okay, so how much stone do you need? Okay, so two, three, four, five, six, seven, like so. Then by doing that, we also get this bonus of either advancing on the stone track here or advancing on the grain track here. So as I mentioned before, you have these crews that are going to be doing work for you, but you have to have grain to be able to feed them. Everybody's going to start off with some starter cards for a starter quarry and starter fields. And you know what? Let's uh, zoom in to get a little bit of a better look here at some of these cards. And yes, uh, Jorge Rodriguez says this game is colorful. This is this is a striking board. Some people might say, oh, it's it's pretty busy. But it is a worker placement game. You have to have a lot of different areas for you to be able to place the workers in a worker placement game. So to kind of give you an idea, this is what these starters look like. So we've got the starting field provides six grain and the starting quarry provides three stone. We can upgrade these as the game progresses. If you do that, you can flip these over. So we have grain here, 10 and six. But to start off, we're going to have Six and three as far as the grain. I'll show you the uh, the crews. So this is our foreman here. So the foreman wears purple. We have the blue crew member. We have the, or I should say crew. We have the green and we also have the yellow. Like so. This is what our player board looks like. Just like so. So we've got where we're going to place our different crews. And this is the strength of each crew. So these three, you start off, you're going to have a strength of three, and your foreman's going to have a strength of two. As we go on, there are ways for you to assign your workers that are going to increase the strengths of these crews. And as the game progresses, you need to have stronger crews in order to be able to to build more uh, more and more as you progress, like as you're building the obelisk, as you're building the colonnades, as you're building the pyramids as well. So if you want to point that out now, it went, say for an example, this is what we're looking at. This is how much grain we need as well each turn to feed our crews. If we don't have enough grain, we actually have to pay a penalty in victory points because of that so as an example here we would actually need 10 grain to be able to feed our crews down along the bottom here this is simply your tracker for how much stone you've got and you just use one of the bricks to do so as well so that is the player board and we also have on the side of the board a breakdown of what's going on in each of the it's rounds i always say turns but each round it's it's each turn is called a round and each round has phases so yes i know my my uh american style gaming vernacular coming through so give me an idea of some of the other 
uh, cards here. So if we were placing a ship on this card spot. So this is an immediate card. So you would get a field, which is red, which uh, does not get uh, a lot of production. But we immediately will advance one on the stone track as well. So we have some that give us like double duty. Some are just like so. So for an example, this is a permanent. So once per building phase, gain one strength for any crew. Keeping in mind, to avoid those penalties, you do need to be able to feed your crews to get up the strength for them. Uh, you can pick up new fields. You can pick up new quarries. So for an example, here's a three. During feeding phase, produce three grain. So we've got that. Kind of give me an idea of these cards over here. This is where you, you're going for the bonus victory points. So green field productivity. So you're, you're you know, kind of aiming at those. The Sphinx cards are interesting because these are kind of like secret victory point bonus cards that you can get. And they cost one stone and one crew point per card, and depending on where you place your ship on the Nile, will determine how many cards you're going to receive anywhere from two to five as your maximum you can purchase. So if, if I'm in the five slot and I have five stone and five crew strength, I could spend that and take five of these cards. Give me an example of some of the cards here. So I'm going to tell you, okay, so these are, these are victory points. So it's going to tell you, have at least two bricks in each of the three statues. You reach the top level in both the grain and stone markets. That'd be worth five. And these are secret. These So these are secret, special uh, little victory point bonuses at the end of the game. I like this. I think this is cool. This is one thing that really makes this game play differently each and every time you play. There are some other things too that I'm going to show you also make this a unique experience every time you play. It's not always the same thing. So something else that's going to change are these cards here. So the statues, the three statues that you can be building in. We've got some that are marked with a B. We've got some that are marked with an A, like so. And you start off, there's three of them. The first one you shuffle up the A's, you select one of the A's, you shuffle up the B's, select one of the B's, and then you put both A and B together, shuffle them up, draw one of those, and that will produce the third statue. I'm going to zoom back out as well, kind of be able to show off that as well. So this is what the, uh, let's use blue, I think it'll show up a little, a little better, as well as this kind of uh, maroon color. So these are what the ships look like. So these are kind of cool. I like these. Nicely done. And then, of course, you just have these bricks. Like so. uh, anyway. Other thing that's going to change is, as we see here, we've got the different slots along the Nile on this side. These circular Nile tiles. Uh, these will change each turn, each round. Yes, Jeff, it's a round. Every round, these are going to change. And we start off the game with them like this, and then we have these Nile tiles that we will shuffle up. And at the beginning of a new round, we are going to place these all along the Nile that has these circular discs. So the order that these actions can uh, that are on the board here is going to change. And that's important because when you're placing your ships, the trick is you can never place a ship above where you place each of your first ships. And I'm going to move out. I'm going to zoom back out so I can show this to you show you what I'm talking. Uh, 
Okay, that should be good. I don't think we need to necessarily have every single aspect of it. So, so these cards also change, obviously enough, right? So we've got the changing cards. We've got these changing bonuses. We've got these changing statues. We've got the variety of Sphinx cards. And we also have these Nile tiles, like so. And when we're starting up a new round after the first, we are going to drop these down. Then when we're going to build, begin the next round, we're going to collect them up, shuffle them up again. So we have different every round. Just like we've got these gold, right? For here. Only one of these is going to be in play for the game, but we have a selection we randomly choose from. Same with the purple. So that's one of the aspects I really do like about Agizia is that it's not always the same exact thing. I will point out, I really honestly don't remember the first edition all that well. It's been over 10 years since I played it. So, and I only played it a couple of times. I enjoyed it then, uh, but I was new to Euro games. You know, everything I had played was all Amira style, you know, Avalon Hill, SPI stuff. Uh, I had not played any European games until uh, Elliot turned me on to them. All right. So what you're going to do is we are going to have different phases that we're going to play each round. So the first thing we could do is we actually set up the Nile. And that would be putting the cards out, placing these tiles out. And we also have irrigation. I'm going to push this up a little bit so we, I can show this off. So we have three different levels of irrigation or seasons. So we start off in the middle. So that basically in the middle here, it shows that Yellow fields and green fields will produce grain. Red fields will not. If this is down here, only green fields are going to produce grain. If this disc is up here, then red, yellow, and green will all produce grain. So there is an aspect of take that in this game because obviously enough, it's a worker placement game. So you're going to be placing workers in spots that your opponents are going to want to put their units. Uh, there's also, you can mess with them by moving around, by going onto the Nile tiles. So for an example here, this allows you to change this. So, you know, if, if players have red fields and you don't have red fields, you're, you're not going to want this to be sitting here with red fields. You're going to want to try to move this down to here. Uh, plus, we've got all the cards as well. So we're going to set these up, and then we're going to have our placement phase. And each player is going to take turns in turn order, which is I had indicated up above, but I've also got the turn order down here on the stone as well as on the grain tractors there. Markets, I should say. So... Let's say I'm the first player. I get to place my ship first. So I get to select. Now, the thing is, there might be stuff like down, lower down the Nile that I really want to get my hands on. Problem is, wherever I place my ship, I can never in that round place another ship above that on the Nile. So you don't want to dive down into the lower portion of the Nile too early in a round unless it's something you really really want to get your hands on so because once everybody goes around and the thing is other players they don't care where you place your ship they can go wherever they want so we could have somebody decide oh okay they're gonna put their ship here someone might say oh well you know what i'm gonna put mine up here and when you place your ships on cards you immediately receive and you just leave your ship here in that space. So then let's say we've got the green player and the green player says, well, hey, I'm going all the way up top because I want to move on up 
and then I want to have my my choice of whatever. You know, I can select anything else down here. Well, when it comes back around to my turn, I can only place my ships from here down. So, and if I decide I want to build, now I'm not going to build right now, but if I decide, okay, so I'm slotting myself because I want to build, then I can only have one ship in each area that's got these at the dock. I can't have more than one ship there. So if you if you start off and you go low down in the Nile, you're going to get what you want. You're going to get the card you want or, or whatever special action you want, right? So like over here, this is basically saying you can improve the strength of your blue crew as well as your yellow crew on your board here. You see, I wouldn't be able to do that because it is above this area here. But these happen, these will happen immediately. You take the card. So for an example, this says, this is immediate. As soon as you get that card, that's gonna happen. Then you also have this red uh, field to uh, produce grain during your feeding. Thing. So we have the placement thing. So everybody's placing. So one thing I do want to point out too is if you get to the point where these slots are filled up and depending on the number of players, you should always have one spot fewer than the number of players. So I, I'm kind of showing this off as if this is a four player game. So in a four player game, once these are filled up, the only thing I can do if I want to try to get in on this is I can actually put a ship there, keeping in mind if I didn't have these down here, right? Because I couldn't do that because that's above where I placed ships. But I can do this and it's considered speculating. So what will happen here is there's uh, these will build in order. And if any one of them can't fulfill the requirements then they actually lose their spot and I slide in. And then of course I would have to meet the requirements as well. But you can do that if you get blocked out of any of the building slots here, you can speculate and keep your fingers crossed and hey, maybe somebody miscalculated and they're like, oh crap, I don't have enough stone, right? I didn't have the right strength of crew in order to do whatever they were looking to do. Uh, as far as the stone, as I mentioned, you got the tracker here. You're just going to move this on the tracker. And you use these to mark your progress on these various, like the colonnades in here, on the pyramid down here. So you got the pyramid as well. And of course, like anything, when you're building a pyramid, you and to be able to, to like put bricks above that, to put stone above it, you have to have the base down below, like so, right? So I couldn't do it like this, but I could do it if those were filled in. If of course I had placed to uh, to build over here. So basically, this area here is to build into the statues or into the pyramid. And then if you have the most bricks in the pyramid, you actually get extra victory points at the end. So what will happen when you're using your crews? You will actually be able to utilize the foreman alongside a crew. So let's say for an example, I need six. I'm looking at, I, I have to get six crew to do something that I'm trying to do, to build Maybe I'm, I'm building on the obelisk or what have you. Now, I can't flip all of these over, collect the six. I can't add these together. The only ones I can add together is I can add the foreman and one of these crews. So say for an example, I needed the six, I would spend these two to get my six crew. So that's something 
people have to keep in mind as well. Uh, that was something that uh, one of Cameron's friends had a hard time following. It's like, no, 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 no. The only thing you're going to add to any of these is this guy. But I mean, it's possible. I mean, you could have stuff like something like this, right? And maybe you need 10. You're going to flip it like that. So you can't add the crews together and uh, add the foreman. You can never add the crews together. You can only add the foreman to a crew to get a total strength of crew. So you've got that. So once we go through the placement phase, let's say we've got all this stuff placed out. We've got cars that have come off the board. Then what we're looking at then is the mining phase. Which is pretty simple. All you're going to do is all of your... Because you're going to have these cards alongside... Let me move this. You're going to have all your, your fields and stuff like that. Your quarries. Your permanents. All along with your... With your player board. Right? So what you might end up doing is... You might end up like doing stuff like that so you're, you're not taking up tons of space but what will happen is you'll have a mining phase that's when you're going to score your stone and that's when you're going to move let's say i started i had four and i go oh, okay well now i got seven simple enough then after that we've got the feeding phase which is super simple it, this is not like uh i remember playing roll through the ages and it was like Oh, man, I don't have food. I don't have enough food for these people again. Elliot used to smoke me like a cheap cigar because I would never, for some reason, have enough food for my populations. Uh, here, it's pretty simple. You're going to you're going to total up all your. Uh, total, you're going to total up all your fields and how much grain they produce. You total up the strength of your crews and your foreman. And you have to have more grain than that. Easy peasy. Simple enough. If you don't, then what will happen is, depending on where you're located on the grain market, let's say I was here, uh, it's going to tell you how many victory points you lose per missing point of grain. So if you're like down here and you're missing three points of grain, that's a negative nine victory points. And uh, there is no like negative track. So what we basically did is uh, if, uh, if somebody was in the negative, just had them stand up their, their stone, little, little brick over there. Although it's pretty obvious when people are at negatives and they're sitting in the forties over here. They're like, uh, no, everybody else is like in the teens as far as victory points. We know that you're in the negative. But somebody was like, hey, you know, uh, I want to make sure that I'm not confused. I'm like, fine. Kind of stand it up on its side. There you go. There's your negative. All right, so we've got the feeding phase. Then we got the building phase. And this is where this gets a little more complex. And this is not a difficult game. This is an easy game to figure out. Uh, I think the thing that throws people the most is just understanding what these cards are what these special markers are and it's all explained in the rules the rules are really nicely presented didn't have any problem figuring this stuff out uh but sometimes the iconography can be a little a little off uh especially on the bonus tiles these tiles over here uh even after playing this a few times, I still need to take a peek to see uh, what's going on. So for an example here, it's like any color field is going to give you an extra two grain. So there we go. Simple enough. Uh, so Flaming Heron's popped in to chat. Good to see you, Flaming Heron. Thanks for uh, swinging on by. All right. So anyway, so uh, then you got the building phase. And this is where you're going to start spending your crews and spending your stone to be able to add to the colonnades. And the thing is, uh, and of course, as we progress from left to right, they become more expensive in order to uh, to build. But what you're gonna see is, for example, in the colonnades, 
you cannot build further along on a statue, on a column, I guess we'll say, uh, that you don't have stone on. So, for an example, if I want to get into the colonnades, I at some point have to get in here. I can't, uh, I can't be sitting there, like, later on in the game and expecting to jump in to here if I, if these aren't completed. Now, if these are completed, yeah, I can jump on in here. So if this is something like that, sure. Easy p I can be in a build if I'm in, in here and I get to build. Yeah, I could go into there. But I couldn't do it if it was like that. So the colonnade uh, is uh, is pretty simple. The obelisk is simple enough too. I mean, as you add the different bricks to it, it's just telling you how much the next one's going to cost you. So that's simple enough. Same with these. Same with the pyramid. The pyramid, like I said, you got to have some sort of a base to be placing uh, the bricks in here. The stone. Well, I call them bricks because. You're spending stone to place the brick. As opposed to keep calling both of these stone. And then, of course, down here, this is the area that uh, we have the choice for the Sphinx card. And the interesting thing is, like for an example here, so we have max two, three, and five. That's the maximum number of cards I could buy by placing it in here. I can place this wherever I want. So for an example, if I want to put it there for the max five, I'm the if I'm the first person in there, that's fine. That's okay. This is like the these are like the last things you're gonna do in your round. Stuff that's down here tends to be end of the round stuff. Because remember, you can't place ships above where you've got ships at. So you try to start higher up and then Work your way down the Nile. Interesting, uh, interesting balancing act that uh, that that also brings up too, because you always have to remember that you're sitting there, you're placing these ships. There isn't necessarily the only limit to placing the ships is the the number of actual ship tokens. Well, ship meeples, I guess we'll say. Because this is the kind of game this also, this will play a little asymmetrical for the players. So if it gets to the point where you have to pass because you can't place another ship, or maybe you don't want to, other players can continue on in that round placing ships. So that's possible as well. So you're going to go through your building phase and then you are going to go through your cleanup, which is uh, basically you're going to reset these cards here. You're, you're going to reset. I was like, where are the discs? They're over here. You're going to go along and you're going to, if you're past the first round, you're going to collect these up, shuffle them up, drop these back out, and drop them down the line here. So these are... This is the new order of what's going on on the Nile. Now, there are things, there are actions on here that are not on the standard board as well. And you will have leftovers when you fill this up. Oops, missed one. So there are going to be some actions that are not utilized each and every round. So I like that too. I like how that kind of changes. So it keeps you on your toes. So eventually what you're going to do is you're going to play through your five rounds and then you're going to add up all your victory points. And one of the big things here is don't forget the Sphinx cards because if you're not purchasing Sphinx cards, and of course, if you can't, if you haven't completed the special mission, I guess we'll say, you don't get the victory point. And of course, more victory points are more difficult but for an example here, if you have the most green fields, you have the majority of production, boom, five victory points. If you have seven bricks in the pyramid, you're going to get eight victory points. That might make you number one, which would also give you an, an additional five. 
So this is also these Sphinx cards, which I gotta be honest, I don't seem to recall these from the original edition. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, they add more wrinkles as well because of course you're going to try to complete your special missions as well to get extra victory points. Another thing I like about these Sphinx cards is that they also really leave it up to the end of who's the who's the victor because victory points unless somebody's really screwing up bad victory points tend to be fairly close in the game you know this isn't a game that i've seen somebody like completely run away with so until we get to the sphinx cards and you can easily come from fourth place to taking it all just by simply completing you know, two or three or more of these special mission cards, which I thought is uh, really cool. Really enjoyed that. Really actually like that aspect. So all in all, that really is how you play Egizia Shifting Sands, is you're simply placing ships, taking cards, doing what the cards say, or collecting locations like more fields, more quarries for more stone, you place ships on these tiles, these Nile tiles, these circular areas to take advantage of that particular special action or whatever event it allows you to do. You're building on the obelisk, the colonnades, the statues, and the pyramids in order to score victory points. Hopefully you're picking up some Sphinx cards along the way with special missions to score more victory points. And there you have it. Whoever finishes up the game with the most victory points is the winner. Gotta be honest, uh, we have not finished in the tie. I do not know what the tiebreaker is. See what it is. Uh, da -da 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 -da. In case of a tie, the tie player with the highest number of player sequence tile wins. Ah, got it. That's actually something I forgot to mention. The player sequence. So these are these here. As I said, we got like four players, right? One, two, three, four. It's just your player order. So when you first start the game, you're going to just randomly get these. I would, I would say get a little draw bag, toss them in there, have people pull them out. So what will happen is you actually get a... Uh, the number of stone you start with is equal to plus one of your start position. So what that helps you do is, because as you go later in the round, you are at a disadvantage. So you're at least getting, at least to start off with, a little bonus as far as the stone. So what'll happen is, at, when you're going and moving into the next round, whoever has the fewest victory points gets number one, Followed by next few is two, three, and four. So there's a little bit of a catch-up mechanic with this turn order. And that is one of the reasons, too, that you don't see somebody... I mean, I'm sure it can happen, but I did not see anybody running away with this game as well. All right, so good thing I remembered by looking in the tiebreaker. I forgot to talk about the little turn sequence. Not a super important aspect of the game. All right, so that is how you play Egizia Shifting Sands. Let's uh, swing back over to uh, the larger camera, and I'll share my final thoughts as well as my review score. So as I mentioned earlier, oh my gosh, I'm sitting here with the wrong date. Ah, oh, can't believe it. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Jeez, I just noticed that. Well, that's a good thing that we haven't had that up for uh, all this time. Jeez. Yeah, that's my fault. My fault. Let me fix this. Ay, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Always something, right? Always something. See, this is why I need to recharge my batteries a little bit. So I don't uh, continue. There we go. All right, get this back out of the way. So that... Uh, that should be showing the correct date. There we go. Yeah, I'm living in the past. Uh, there you go. So, Madman says, 
need a new draw bag. Gotta go get another bottle of Crown Royal. That's what my uh, dice bag is. Uh, it's, you know, that's old school, right? Good old old school dice bag. It's your uh, Crown Royal bag. All right. So anyway, uh, I like Agizia. Yeah, and, and I am the first to point out that I am not always the biggest fan of Euro games out there. Simply because I don't like games that all just sit there as, you know, playing in a vacuum. I always call it playing in a vacuum. Or whatever I do has absolutely no effect on the other players in the game. It's just I'm kind of figuring out a little puzzle. Like a lot of these games are a lot of Euro games, Euro style games, are kind of almost like a little puzzle aspect to it, and you're playing your own piece of that puzzle. Agizia doesn't play like that because it is a worker placement game at its heart. Worker placement games, you are messing with other people's plans. So I do like that. I like a little take that. A lot of games are like a lot of take that. It's just, that's how I grew up. You know, we, we played a lot of war games, a lot of confrontational games. Uh, back when I was in high school, the only co-op games out there were role-playing games. So that was co-op. So I do uh, like the fact that you are not playing in a vacuum and the choices you make during your phase of the round matter to the other players. So I do like that as well. I like the fact that this is a very easy game to wrap your head around. I like the fact that there's also a lot of things that change from game to game and even from round to round, such as the Nile tiles and the Nile cards will be changing. I love the fact that we got the Sphinx cards, which allow you to sock away hidden victory points that people won't know about until the end of the game. Hopefully you're able to complete your missions. I will point out that the theme of building monuments in ancient Egypt, it's all right. It's not, it, it doesn't come across as completely just tacked on, but, uh, hey, you know, but it's still a great game. I really, really do enjoy this game. Do like it a lot. Uh, the, uh, the grain market and the stone market are kind of, eh, whatever. I mean, the stone market is basically allowing you to get extra stone each mining phase. And the grain market, eventually, if you move high enough on the grain market, you can actually sell excess grain for victory points. So there is a point to that as well. But there isn't a much, there isn't a lot of the gameplay that really is going to revolve around those, uh, those markets, those tracks. So, all in all, I actually give Igizia Shifting Sands a very, very solid 8.7 out of 10. Uh, thematically, but still, as a worker placement game, it's a lot of fun. It's got a lot of variety, and it plays in a relatively quick amount of time. You can get a two-player game in in about an hour once uh, both players know what they're doing. And, of course, the board is different. I do like that too, that there is a special board and some special rules for two player games. So uh, you don't need to have three or four players to enjoy some Igizia. Uh, all in all, like I said, 8.7 out of 10. Igizia Shifting Sands is from Stronghold Games. It is for two to four players, ages 14 and up. Plays in around 90 minutes. That's what the box says. Also, the 14 and up, it's it's got to be because of this stuff gotta be don't have to be 14 to know how to play it so if you have have younger children who are 12 years old and you can trust them not to put this stuff in their mouth and swallow it easy peasy easily get them into the game this is available now uh, it does carry an msrp of 49 dollars and 95 cents i have seen it for about 36 online thereabouts for 36 bucks it is a sweet deal. It is a very sweet deal. So Fleming here, I mentioned that uh, all days blend into one for me. Sometimes they do. Sometimes cause it's like, wait a sec. So what was the day? When did I? Okay, so I did that Pathfinder video that Thursday. Yes, well, especially when I'm doing, you know, a show almost every weeknight. So those of you who popped in late, I uh, do want to repeat once again that the announcement for the future of 
the Daily Dope is I am taking the rest of this week off and I will return next Monday. We are going to do just news on the Daily Dope. It's just we're going to do about a half hour, try not to go more than 40 minutes or so. But we will focus on gaming news and uh, I will continue to do my standalone videos with my unboxings and first looks, things like that. And there will be no live streams on Friday nights. So it'll be Monday through Thursday. So because I am actually trying to get a group together here in the uh, Chicago suburbs, hopefully by me, uh, to do some gaming Friday nights. Yay. Because it's getting to the point I cannot, can't depend on Elliot, my best friend, to, uh, to get an opportunity to play games. Because uh, he's got just, you know, home life work stuff like that family so he uh been really really tough and uh my nephew cameron he's working a little more often so uh yeah i'm trying to see if i can uh get a group of gaming uh together out here in uh the yorkville area who knows don't know i have no idea all right so that is it for tonight's show so that is the announcement there uh the game uh, the gaming gang the Daily Dope will continue. Just like I said, gonna take a little recharge my batteries throughout uh, this week. I'm gonna change up some uh, some of the standard videos that we've got, like the outro and and things like that. So, anyway, that's it for tonight. Of course, I will be back again next Monday, same time. So, mark those uh, those calendars. Same bat time, same bat channel. Of course, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Uh, I find it amazing people watch live a lot. Don't give videos thumbs up. Said, mentioned that earlier. Weird. But anyway, of course, subscribe to the channel too. If you do, ring that little bell because it will not only notify you of when the Daily Dope goes live, it'll also tell you when my standalone videos get uploaded, which I've got a few lately. Check them out. Especially like Starfinder. I did the, uh, eh, it's buried somewhere. Did the uh, Deck of Many Worlds. Zoom right in so you can get a really good good look at the uh, the cards and the deck and how those work. Pretty interesting. I thought it was pretty unique. So, uh, by all means, do that. And of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. You know the drill. Get your geek on at gaminggang.com. So until next Monday, everybody have a great week. Enjoy a great weekend. Hope everybody gets some gaming in, gets to relax. Keep in mind, there will still be news up on the gaminggang.com. There will still be things popping up on Twitter. So just because I'm taking a break from doing the show for the rest of the week does not mean there is no gaming news hitting. Also, do want to mention... If you came in late, I did receive La Resistance from Flying Pig Games. This is currently in the midst of a Kickstarter. I'll have a video of this on Wednesday. It's probably just going to be a, a look through to take a peek at the game itself. Uh, if I can get a chance to play this, then I will share some thoughts about it. I do not do reviews of things that are on Kickstarter, even though this is shrink wrapped and this looks like the finished product. Still now. All right. So, anyway, those of you out there who watched live and hung out and chat, thank you very much. I always appreciate you taking some time out to hang with me so I don't feel like a doofus just speaking into a camera. And, of course, if you're watching after the fact, maybe even on Memorex, I appreciate that as well. Thank you so very much. Everybody enjoy the rest of your week. I will be back on Monday with batteries recharged. And of course, until then, happy trails. If this change is over. Ah, see, that's what happened when I changed the date. Messed all this up. All right, see you, gang. Oh, you're still here.
Well, if that's the case, by all means, subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel by clicking right here. And of course, if you want to catch up on past episodes of The Daily Dope, check out this playlist. And if you'd like to see what YouTube's recommending you take a peek at from the channel, just give a click right over here. Of course, I'm Jeff McAleer, and once again, thank you very much for watching.